Hello, everybody. Hey there, ED. It's good to see you. Missed you last week. Hey, Tugboat. Hello, Kelly. Nice to see you. Hey, Mark. There's Pippi Pop. Hey, Math Raptor. Hey, I'm glad to see you, everybody. I hope you've had a nice week. How's the, is the audio okay? I put the mic in a different place. It looks like it's okay. Might be a little bit quiet. Yeah, multicam today. I got um, my face camera, got my desk camera, and I got the palette camera finally set up. It is um, very exciting. Let me see if I can get this mic a little closer to me. Is that maybe any better? I'm trying to, hmm, I don't know. It looks like it's my, I have a little audio meter and it looks like it's peaking a little bit, still a little bit lower than normal, but I don't know. Hey Trevor, hey Stacy, kamikaze style, how you doing? So with the setup now, you can finally see my palette. It's a little bit on the dirty side. Clean it up. I thought I might talk a little bit about it, especially today. Um, what do you guys want to know about my watercolor palette? Actually, I have like a two-stage setup here. I have a watercolor palette and then I have a glass palette. And the glass palette is just under here. And then you can't quite see it. Actually, let me see if I switch to the thing. I have a ton of chaos like back this way too where I keep all of my recently used tools piled up. No, Ma, it's not feeling so good tonight. They're staying, staying in bed. But it's nothing, it's nothing bad, it's just normal stuff. Um, do I prefer any special watercolor brands? Yes, I do. So here's my watercolor Tupperware. And this is my favorite brand is uh, M. Graham and Company. Do you, will it focus on that? I don't know if this camera will focus that close. I like these guys. They're, um... They're actually kind of local to me. They're just um, maybe 20 miles away. I also like Holbein colors a lot. Do I have, here's like one of their old kinds. Do I have any of their new guys? So I like Holbein a lot. And then my third choice is, uh, where'd it go? I know I saw some in here. These guys, the um, Windsor and Newton um, Professional. These are good. I do not like the Cotman colors. Those are always very sort of pasty. Um, the Professional has like good levels of pigment. And then I use a little bit of Daniel Smith um, Daniel Smith is sort of known for having a lot more um, sort of weird pigments and unusual colors. Um, so I use these guys for um, a few things. Like I'm trying, I'm just trying out now this um, this rose permanent color and giving it a shot. Um, and I do like their uh, pyrrol orange, which is this guy right here. And you can see I got my palette 
cool to warm. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. These kind of on camera all look the same, but it's like this is black and this is like ultramarine blue and this is Prussian blue. And this one I really like a lot. That's, um, uh, what color is that? It's not my Prussian blue. Man, what is it called? That's it. It's my turquoise, duh, yeah. Really love this turquoise color. And I think this is cobalt blue, this light blue. Um, although I am kind of trying to get, uh, find a replacement for that just because uh, cobalt is toxic. And I don't, like I managed to get rid of all the cadmium, which is another big toxic one that they use a lot for reds and, and yellows and oranges. Um, we got my yellow. This stuff is great. This is my Hansa yellow, and it is a very, very bright yellow. Um, very handy um, for getting greens and reds both to be really bright, is mixing in a little bit of this. Um, even if it doesn't, if it's not enough to change the real appearance of the color, it will make it like, it will make greens and reds both really bright. And I always love a little Indian yellow. Um, I, use, I love this color a lot, like I said, the pyrrol orange. I think that's how you pronounce it. P-Y-R-R-O-L. Um, that is just a great, beautiful orange. Like I often will mix that in with reds. Like this right here is, um, what is that? Oh, that's my pyrrol red. So I'll often mix in a little bit of that orange to, to get it to really pop a little bit better. Um, what else is there to say about this? The things I really struggle with on my palette that I'm never really happy with are always the browns. I use Burnt Umber and I use uh, Raw Sienna. And um, they're never quite the color I want them to be. You know, they're always just a little bit too sort of blue or a little too red. And it's hard to find a color that sits in a really nice brown. Um, I do like this transparent orange iron oxide. Transparent orange iron oxide, which is this. And it looks bla pretty black on the camera, but it's actually a pretty good yellowy brown. I use it pretty, pretty regular. So I do all of my watercolor mixing on this palette. And the big secret, you can kind of see like this pink staining. The big secret with these is to use those um, magic erasers, like these guys. And then with just the tiniest bit of elbow grease, you can actually get those cleaned up, get the staining off of there which is good because otherwise like a lot of the reds and like my turquoise will stain pretty good. Um, all my reds like to stain. Um, so this is all my watercolor palette. And then I use this guy for ink. Well, when I want to do like a ink wash and for acrylic stuff. And these guys I clean with a X-Acto blade. Well, not an exacto blade, like a, a razor blade in this little holder. And on the glass, you can just really scrape it off and it comes clean. And then always have my toilet paper. Man, you remember at the beginning of COVID how like, at least in the States, you could not get toilet paper? It almost got to be a real bad situation in the studio because I need this stuff. Uh, this palette is, wait, who asked to who, who makes the palette? Have you ever visited their watercolor factory tugboat? No, I have not ever been there. I don't think that they, I think they're one of those places where like their manufacturing process is like super secret. So they keep it, um, 
kind of locked down. I should send him an email though and just tell him I love him and that they should sponsor me. <laughs> there we go, Pippi Pop. Who makes that palette? This palette is made by Alvin. These guys. Same. I think that's the same company that makes like all the rulers and stuff like that. Um, this palette, I do not know who makes it, but you can get it at just about any art store. We'll have this, it's glass with just like a frosted white paint on the underside. So this is really good for like when I'm using my inks, like when I'm doing little ink washes, lots of times what I'll do is I'll take it and I'll just put a little drip down and a little bit goes a long way. And then I can water it down. And then if we go back here, I can do my do my thing. Whatever this is. And then I can I can really get like the exact uh, thinness I want of my wash. Using the using the glass palette, and that is a huge um, boon. It took me forever to figure out to use a glass palette. Back when I was doing a lot of oil painting, I used glass palettes for oil painting because you can scrape it off and, and get it you know back to clean and keep using it for forever. Um, so it never occurred to me to use it for inks until I started using them a lot and then I really needed a way to mix them because the way I was doing it was just on paper and um, the paper dried out the inks faster because it absorbed the ink and then um, and as it was the same when I tried to thin it it's like the water would just get soaked into the paper and you would you'd lose your ink you didn't have to put out more and more and more but it's remarkable how like just one single drop can go for so far. And so I've been using ink more and more and more as like um, my finishing layers of sort of shading or whatever. Um, I usually do a little bit of a black wash and a brown wash, at least on Lonesome Hunters, especially there's a, a black wash and a brown wash on at the end of every page, basically to tighten things up. And then if you get it before it dries, you can always just wipe it off and have a clean palette. That's good to go. Hey, Rudak. Good to see you. Yeah, it does kind of look like fall leaves. Maybe that's where we should go with this. Maybe we should do an ink. Pull out some leaf colors. So last week was my very first OBS live stream. And um, I'm loving this. I think I got it down so that the, the chat isn't so far behind. Which is nice. Or rather, I guess the chat wasn't far behind. It was me that was far behind.
So I have basically spent the week doing pre-production for some stuff and testing out papers and um, it's been frustrating, man. It is so much work to see if a paper is worth using only to find out that it's not or to be like, to find out like it's Like it's better at some things, but worse at other things. So it's a trade-off and you never know if it's like, it's just hard to know if the trade-offs are worth it. Yeah, man. Oh, nice. Pippi, you got the ghouls just want to have fun. Thanks for picking that up. I hope you like it. That was very fun. I never, um, Pretty sure that's my first DC um, interior work, and it may be my first published DC work. Do you like using hot press or cold press more for your ink and watercolor work? I prefer hot press this right here i'm using a cold press um just because i had it um and i'm trying to just use it up and using it for the for the live stream is a great way to go um but uh i like cold press i like smooth paper my favorite paper it's worth repeating this every time is this stuff my Strathmore mixed media paper 400 series it's got this picture on it that's my go-to that's my um, that's my main uh, paper and I think even after doing all my paper tests I think I'm just gonna go back to that it's um, it's just great paper Oh, Rudak, how's how is that Monica book? I have not actually been able to peek at it yet. Well, Ed, the the DC gig came about just because um, I had worked with the editor a long time ago on when she was at Marvel, Katie Kubert. She actually had hired me to work on um, a Man-Thing book. And then I had to pull out at the last minute. I was like trying really hard to figure out how to do it and I just, it ended up not being a thing that I could, I could do with my other work responsibilities. But I ended up doing the covers for that Man-Thing series. And, um, and yeah, so she edited, I think she edited the whole anthology for this. And so, um, yeah, so she just gave me a call and asked me if I wanted to do it. And it actually, like, my problem with working for both Marvel and DC is that they usually have very short lead times. Like, they usually, um, when they contact me, at least, you know, they always want me to start in the next week or two. So um, this was just a rare occurrence where I was available. So I said, yeah. And it was fun. Yeah, thanks, Mark. It is like, it is fun. Like, I wish there was, I wish anthologies did better. Because it is really fun to be able to do some short stories. Like, it would, and I think that everyone, <laughs> I think just about every uh, writer and artist would love to, when they come off of a big project, have a have like short story projects that they can work on for just a little bit to sort of like reset their brain. I know I really, um, I really like that. Ed, you gonna plan to take more big two gigs? Um, 
I don't have any plans for it especially, but I, I wouldn't mind it. There's definitely um, uh, books at the big two that I think I would be well suited for and I would like to do. Um, but like I said, it's, it's almost always like a scheduling thing, a scheduling challenge. I'm kind of just doodling. I hope that's I hope that's not too boring. That's um. I guess now that I officially gave this show a name, having it be an actual cooldown is the way to go. Yes, the headless horseman. Um, I. I need to look it up and see when that's coming out. It might... I don't think it came out. I think I would have heard about it if it had come out. I haven't gotten copies of it yet. But sometimes sometimes it takes them a little while to get me my, my copies of anything. But Headless Horseman is the short story that I did with David Dustmalchen and um, Leah Kilpatrick. And it's sort of a comedy thing about um, a mummy and a um, vampire and a werewolf and a mummy, a vampire, a werewolf, and a Frankenstein. And they're all little kids and they go to a haunted house and in the world of monsters, when you go to a haunted house, they just show you uh, vignettes of awful uh, human life things, and that's what scares them. So that's what that one's about. So it's kind of a cartoony, cutesy pie thing that I did that was really fun to do. My cat is here to try to make the live stream interesting. Come on. You don't want to drink the water. Kelly says that Headless Horseman comes out October 18th. And I believe her. That's a little more accurate. <laughs> nice, Kelly. I need to get out to some... Someone else was posting pictures of going to some uh, corn mazes today, and it looked actually really fun. It's beautiful out today, man. Here in Oregon, it's been um, practically uh, balmy, which, as terrifying as that is for our current global warming situation... It's been kind of nice for getting out of the house a little bit. And one of the things about being in Oregon is like after a certain point, you kind of just stay indoors, or at least I do. Just 
can be a little bit of a bummer. But it's like I'm an indoor kid anyway. Yeah, this is the kind of fall weather where I need to try to get out to the beach before it gets real miserable out there. I think it was 96 here in LA today. Morning and nights are really nice, but midday is terrible. Oof, man, I don't miss, I don't not miss Southern California as much as I thought I would when we moved. I thought, um, I mean, we actually stayed in San Diego for years longer than I probably should have because um, I thought uh, no place would have such good weather. And, um, I am happy to report that sunny and like incredibly hot 24-7 is not like the, actually the best weather. This is, God, this is a goofy picture I'm making. This is like, if Bob Ross was like bad at his job. But I don't know if I've actually really shown too much about how I work with inks. So having my palette out and being able to show it like this is probably... I don't know if it's something that anybody cares about, then it is. And this is, it's happening. <laughs> if you weren't reading a book, you're in the woods. Yeah, man, I love, actually, as soon as I moved to Oregon, I got really into being in the woods. But that wasn't really an option um, growing up in Southern California. There was like chaparral and um, and that was it. Although I did spend a lot of time out skateboarding when I was younger. The only problem with using ink is, like I said, you only need a little drop, but like, you can kind of see this is already starting to dry up. It's getting a little crusty. This guy's starting to get a little bit crusty. It's like, I end up having to clear my palette pretty regular. You can see that burnt umber left a little bit of schmutz.
uh, Rudek, right now I am using only inks for this. Oh yeah, thank you, Mark. Don't forget to like and subscribe the video. I've complained about saying that in the past, but I'm trying to get over my, my whatever weird hang up I have with that. Because it really does like help the, help other people find the channel, join the streams. And the more the merrier. So the cool thing about working with inks is that they work just like watercolor. They're very heavy pigments. Um, I mean, they're heavy in pigments. There's lots of pigments in them. And um, you can get this nice gloopy gloppy blending that I like so much. Um, but it's like it doesn't reactivate when you do multiple layers, which is really cool. Very handy. Because watercolor, it's like you're very limited by how many times you can go over the top of it before um, it just turns into a, a brown mess. But with the inks, you can just keep building and building and building. And so what I like to do is I like to use watercolor to begin with when I want sort of the, the paint to be a little bit more malleable and like flexible and adjustable. And then once I get it to a certain point, um, then I sort of switch to ink and start doing ink washes. And... Um, they sort of start to lock down my image. Thank you, Rudak. <laughs> I don't know if Frankenstein lives here. This looks more like a, a Calvin and Hobbes thing to me. I'm using a little bit of the Payne's Gray here. It's a fun. So that's a, I guess that's something too that's worth noticing about how I work with things. Lots of times I'll just get a wet brush and I'll put it on my palette and then I'll get just a touch of ink and mix it in with the water when I want something to be very light. Do you guys know of anybody else who works with colored inks? I know of one guy whose name I cannot recall, which is typical for me on stream, but he's like a war correspondent kind of a guy. I think he was in, I think he was like a, in the army in Iraq, and now he does like... Um, I don't know what he does. He does something where he travels around and, and does a lot of ink drawings of wherever he's visiting. And he's really, really good. Very efficient. Yeah. 
Edie asks, do you have a tube of paint that you still use but can't get anymore because their company is defunct or that product was discontinued? Not really. Um, I am... I go through so much stuff that I... Um, if, I, if it's something that I use, like I go, I use it all. It's all used up. Like there's, I don't think there's anything that I'm holding on to or anything like that. Um, I've talked in the past about using Ruby Lith to do color separations. And I had like a roll of Ruby Lith that I carried around for, man, like at least a decade before I gave up on it. That I wasn't ever going to use it again. Um, yeah, I just, I, I tend to use, I tend to either use it or not use it. Like, there's not like a, there's not a lot of stuff that I hang on to. And I, if something is discontinued, then I find a replacement, like, as soon as I possibly can. I don't, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time, like, I don't know how to describe that, like, being sad about dead um, art materials just because I know that everything that I love is going to be discontinued one day McConey does a little bit uses some some colored inks oh yeah and I think you're right, Math Raptor, that colored inks are huge in Japan. You're talking about Feral um, Dalrymple Rudek? <laughs> Thanks, Rudek. Yeah, that can't have light without shadow. Mike McConey, he does watercolor superhero pinups. Oh, I don't know if I'm familiar with him. I'll have to look him up. Oh. Can you see how dirty my water already is? There we go. Can you see the difference between these two colors? Ugh. Ugh. Let's try this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the dirty water means I'm working. This is my little water bucket. I guess this is worth showing to you. I got a dirty side and a clean side. Usually a little swish in the dirty side and my brush is ready to put in the clean side and it'll be fine. But um, sometimes the dirty side gets too dirty.
this yellow too, by the way, this is um, FW Inks. Uh, what's the name of this stuff? This is their Indian yellow. And this stuff is great. When I need a really bright yellow, um, I usually use this stuff instead of watercolor. Um, I like my Hansa yellow. It's a very um, sort of cool yellow as far as yellow would go, yellows go. But um, this stuff is just like yellow, yellow, yellow. Very good. And uh, this might this might show up on camera pretty good, like. You know how I was saying, like, adding a really good bright yellow to a red will make the red really pop? But, like, look at this area. We'll put this really bright yellow on there. And you can see, like, it looks more, like, it looks like I'm making it red by adding yellow. Like, it looks like I'm making it more red somehow. And it just is because yellow has that really high chroma. Like, it has really bright saturation and since um, red is like yellow and magenta then when you add that like the real saturation in reds come from the yellows and not from the magenta well like it comes from both but um, in my experience adding more yellow makes it like really really bright Kelly asks, how was RCCC? Um, it was good. I had a lot of fun. I got to see a lot of um, friends that I have not seen in years. Um, I came away from there hoping that um, I would know how I felt about comic book conventions going forward, and um, I really don't. Like, yeah, I just do not know what to think about comic conventions yet. There's been, um, there's some couple, there's a couple outdoor ones, like a bunch of people were posting from the Boise comic convention, um, and I kind of really wished that I had gone to that because um, they were outdoors at the zoo, which is like, I couldn't imagine a better comic convention experience than hanging out in a zoo all day. But it was good. It was very crowded. It was too crowded for me. But um, when it wasn't too crowded, it was great. Oh, Tugboat, I always get nervous when people use coffee cups for their watercolor water. I fear they're going to drink it by accident. I have a very strict rule in this house that uh, paint and everything goes on the right-hand side. And then you can't see it, but drinks go on the left. Like, and that's a rule that I do not break. And um, it has served me pretty well. Because I've only drinking my paint water maybe twice. And then I decided um, I needed to get serious about never doing that again. <laughs> um... Kamikaze style says, are you coming down to L.A. in December? No, I'm not. Um, right now, I don't have any plans for any conventions. Because um, even if, like, going to the convention would be okay, I'm still, like, not looking forward to being on an airplane. I really feel like that's whenever everyone gets sick at a convention, I feel like 90% of it is from the airport, not necessarily from the convention. But that's just me. I don't know. I'm kind of kind of traumatized and paranoid after the pandemic. Yeah, Concred, like I used to get Concred every convention just about. 
and I have not missed it. In fact, I have not actually been sick in like four years now. Like I've had a couple things come up, but I haven't like gotten a cold and I haven't gotten a flu in like four years. And that is like, that's hard to give up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to give up not being sick all the time. Oh, that's right, Kelly. You got COVID when you were like in Mexico, right? That's the worst. Yeah, for real, ZD. Concred was no joke. Like, sometimes there was some pretty serious, like, flus that went around. And I have heard that there have been um, a bunch of strains of the flu that seem to have gone extinct from the number of people who masked in recent years, which is pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Pippi asks, does anyone remember the SDCC where everyone was crapping all over the place? I don't remember that, but I, um, I definitely believe that it happened. Do you remember what year that was? Isn't that every SDCC? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good, Trevor. I'm glad you made it out unscathed. Man, the funniest story I ever heard about San Diego Comic-Con, and I guess I probably shouldn't name names, but... Um, a bunch of big name creators apparently were doing so much cocaine. Like this was in the nineties when creators were making millions and selling millions of books and a bunch of big name guys were doing so much cocaine that they actually put one of them on a plane and flew them from LA to, I don't know, San Francisco or someplace to go get more cocaine because they didn't know where to buy it in San Diego. Which is really funny, because at the time, you could buy cocaine literally anywhere in San Diego. San Diego was kind of a mess. They had to put cardboard down the aisles for people pooping their pants? I do not recall that. Doing, um... Uh, Let's talk about how great this year's San Diego Comic-Con was. <laughs> like Trevor's saying. Focusing on comics is like very exciting, actually. I've been, I used to live in San Diego and I would go to San, to San Diego Comic-Con every year. Um, I worked in the video game industry, but it was real easy to get a pro pass. And, um... Yeah, I just went every year and had a great time. Um, but I never, like, hung out with the cool kids or did anything like that. I mostly just spent money. But my very first San Diego was 1986, I think. Me and my buddy Zach went together. And I think I had, like, somehow amassed a fortune of, like, 100 bucks to take with me which was pretty great I think that's where I bought my first mage comic books was at that 86 convention
Yeah, Edie, I heard that same thing, that just big, the movie studios being not there was nice. I don't really begrudge the studios being at these conventions, but, um, no, I take that back. I do begrudge it a little bit. It's a bummer how much they just take sort of the, the steam out of the, I don't know what to, I don't know the metaphor I want to use, but they definitely take over. Kamikaze style. You could go up with a business card. Yeah, I used to, I always bought mine in advance and, um, well, I reserved mine in advance. And yeah, you just had to, I, <laughs> I, in fact, I think I've had to fax them a business card and gotten my, my pass that way. That's how long I was going for. Yeah, now it's, I think it's a lot tougher nowadays. I don't know if they even give them out to video game folks anymore. <laughs> I don't know if it's nighttime yet, Tugboat. It's definitely like sunset. Still the sun coming up through the trees. So what do you guys think? Is this like a good, is this a big enough shot of the palette? Do I need to like make it a 50-50 shot or do I need to make it smaller? <laughs> the cat's trying to get in frame occasionally. She gave up on me. I don't know where she went, actually. Nice. I'm glad that the tugboat, or that, <laughs> thank you tugboat, I'm glad that the Palakam is a winner. I don't know what needs to be added to this, like, it's kind of just a goof around cool down. I'm wondering, like, if I could hit it with some airbrush, if that would bring anything to it. I could maybe do a little bit of a gradient on the sky with some airbrush, but I don't know if it'll actually like help anything. I kind of feel like it needs some colored pencil for some reason. Like now I need a colored pencil cam Dang. So I kind of feel like, how dry is this? Kind of dry. Oh, you know what I want? This is what it's, this is what it's begging for is this. I 
that's kind of this outline. have any really good oranges in Prismacolor like I feel like all my oranges are a little bit like salmon colored I'm not sure why this, I don't know why this is working, but I think it's working. <laughs> Definitely makes it feel a little bit more like an intentional image. It was feeling a little bit like, like I was saying, kind of doodly. Also, this paper, this is just um, paper I'm using, is this stuff, this fluid watercolor paper. And it's just not quite the best for ink, I don't think. I think it works a little better with um, watercolor. Don't really know why. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do keep my pencils on the on the drink side, but I'm not a, a big risk of drinking my pencils. One thing that I have been on the hunt for is a an opaque pencil. Like, this white, like, is kind of, this is a Prismacolor white, and it's, like, kind of opaque, but I don't know, it's, like, it's, it's a little transparent. And, man, I would really like to find a pencil that is actually truly opaque. Sometimes I use this a lot, this sort of pale yellow, because it's, it's almost as opaque as the white, but it's a little bit yellow, <laughs> which is very, which is more helpful than like a perfect white. This isn't doing a whole lot, but if I come in with, I guess this red, and instead of trying to make it brighter, make stuff darker, that might actually be better.
Yeah, Redact, that might be it, that it just says more illustration than painting when you add the, the lines. I don't know. The other thing it's really like screaming for is more splatter. I am running low on this orange. I kind of like this more orangey sky. It's a little more green gray. That's working for me. And I don't know if you can tell from the stream, but I got my table is at a slight angle. And I use that a lot with my paintings so that I can um, get gradients because all the pigment will tend to flow downhill. And that is very handy to use a little gravity. Yeah, kamikaze style. I got, I've had this thing for at least like 10 or 12 years. I've dropped it so many times, it's like barely actually sticking together anymore. Like the two halves of the plastic are pretty much wanting to separate. But still does the trick. Thanks, Pippi. Yeah, it's kind of coming together into a thing. You know, what's everyone reading this weekend? I am reading manga. I got the new Witch Hat Atelier to get through. Well, not the new one, but um, a new one to me. I think it's volume four. And I also got a pile of... Uh, uh, Power Man and Iron Fist that I got at Rose City Comic Con out of the dollar bin that I'm looking forward to reading. And a bunch of Kazars too. I like, I'm a, I'm a Kazar guy. <laughs> yeah, I can see this being the end of one of my comics. 
It could be Lonesome Hunters or um, Harrow County. I feel like this wants to go, like this wants some opaque stuff. I think this is where the acrylic wash comes in. This is worth showing off too since we're looking at my palette. I don't know if you can see the little tentacles on my ink. This is my black ink well. The Mott made this for me back when I was still doing BPRD. Very fond of that. A Silent Voice. Is that a manga? Pippi's reading Ghouls Just Want to Have Fun and Sacrificers. I have not heard of that one. I haven't heard of Good Intentions either, ED. Jock's Batman book, always good. Jock is really good. Ghost Story by Peter Straub. Oh, an original omnibus of Alden McWilliams' Dracula comic. Interesting. I've been trying really hard to make more time to actually sit down and just read. And um, it's hard sometimes, man. Especially when I have a lot of stuff that I need to read for work. Ugh, too much brown. One thing about, so I like my glass palette a lot, but it's not super good for acrylic wash because it just dries so fast. This is the kind of piece that I, I wish that I had actually done in my sketchbook instead of on loose leaf paper. Like, it feels more like a goof around sketchbook piece to me than a something that should be on its own piece of paper floating around my studio for the rest of my life. It's a ma manga about a boy that bullies a hearing impaired girl. Then six years later meets her again, is forced to confront his own cruelty. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Rudak is reading The Talisman. Good Omens. Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. I'm actually, I'm listening to the audiobook of a Terry Pratchett book right now. The, one of the guards stories. 
That's pretty fun. I like Terry Pratchett a lot. He is very funny and very good at being funny without being mean, which is a rare talent. Like a lot of people compare Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams, but um, like I would read Terry Pratchett over Douglas Adams any day. Have you read The Price by Neil, Neil Gaiman, I presume? Do you think Harrow County Library Editions will ever get reprinted? Man, kamikaze style. I do not know. I'm really bummed that they are in their, like, print limbo that they've been in for so long. Because I definitely know that, like, um, there are a lot of people who want to get those and just cannot. And it's very frustrating. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I would sure like to. Um, if you want to uh, very politely um, tag Dark Horse in any social media post to ask about it, then um, that could be helpful because they do they do pay attention to that stuff, even though it might not feel like it. It's starting to look a little rainy. I'm a fan of, I don't know why I do this, but I like these like vertical strokes, all parallel lines. I tend to do that quite a bit and I, I don't know what it is, but it looks cool to me. One thing I like, like I don't use uh, cool press paper very often, but I do like how it works with acrylic gouache. Like I love that texture. Like that's fun. Yeah, Mark, if, if Harold County got picked up for TV or movie, then yeah, it would definitely, they would reprint those in a heartbeat. And we're still trying. I actually need to touch base with um, some people now that the writer's strike is over and see what, what they're thinking. Um, but as it stands, I'm not really holding my breath for... Harrow County TV show. But it would be great, man. I would be over the moon if that were to happen. Unfortunately, they don't let me run Hollywood, and I don't know why. Anybody read the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service manga? I, you know, I've started to read that a couple times. That's a Dark Horse publishes that in the U.S. and um, and they gave me copies um, one time, 
and uh, it just didn't really grab me. I don't know what it was about it. I've been the manga I've been reading is Twentieth um, Century Boys, and then now I got some Witch Hat Atelier on my on my plate. I gotta get. I read them digitally, and I need to buy print copies of um, Blame, which is one of my favorite manga of all time. Twentieth Century Boys is pretty fun. It's a little bit meandering, I think. There's definitely, it's one of those mangas that definitely you get the feeling like um, it was successful and so they sort of start just string some things out a little bit, but um, but it's mostly really fun. Like I'm at a part where there's this um, sort of newish character who, um, I can't remember her name, but she's like one of my favorite characters in the series where she's like... Um, She's kind of a screw up in high school and she has to write this paper. So she chooses to write a paper about like one of the critical uh, things that happens in 20th century boys in the, that it happened, you know, it happened at the turn of the century. And, uh, and it's really funny because she gets put on this list and has to, gets sucked into actual the real adventure but she's just like the screw up and she keeps making really funny faces it's it's good oh yeah you know i don't know rudak if you're in the u.s you could try um bookshop.org that's where i buy a lot of my stuff online um and I bet you could find it that way. This white is a bad idea. It is not working very good. Yeah, Math Raptor, the omnibus editions of 20th Century Boy, that's how I've been reading them. They're a really good size. There's a lot of story, and it's, like, not too big that you can't, like, hold it and read it. <laughs> Hey, non-human audio's here. How you doing? It's good to see you, man. All right, I think I'm gonna call this a night. Let's go ahead and do our do the tape. something it's not anything to write home about but but it was fun yeah I miss you too man not doing conventions has been like I've been missing all my buddies Thanks, dude. Hey, I still got um, non-human audio. I still got to dig through and find those pictures. I've been meaning to do it, but 
Um, hopefully I can I actually have to dig through my art and find a bunch of stuff this weekend. So hopefully I can get to that. Yeah, so that is, that's it for this week. That's how my palette works. Um, you can see as I go, it usually ends up looking like this where it's piled up with shit and I have to um, put everything away. And yeah, the camera setup worked out really well. I think uh, I think this is a winner. I still feel like a goober putting my my face on here, but I know people like that. Um, oh, let me do. There, now it's done. All right, everybody, that's that's it. I'm out of here. Thank you so much for joining me. It, um, it was fun, as always. I always can't believe that people hang out with me to chill out on a Friday night, but um, I'm grateful for it. So don't forget to tell all the people that you love how much you love them. And I hope you all have a great weekend, and I'll see you next Friday. Bye, everybody.